terminology. A feeding difficulty is actually any problem that negatively affects the process of providing food or supplying nourishment to the child. This is a two-way relationship between a caregiver and a child. Feeding difficulties arise from an amalgam of contributing factors, the food, the child, and the parent. Is the quantity of food presented appropriate? In modern times, parents present their children with high volumes of food. They don't know what the expectations really are of how much food the child needs. But a quantity that is too high can discourage the child's interest in feeding. Is the food developmentally appropriate? There are two common things that we see. On the store shelves, the jarred food, towards about a year of age, starts to have lumps of food in the puree. This is developmentally inappropriate for the child. It's a double consistency food and shouldn't be presented until about four to six years of age. The child who is normal developmentally will swallow the food whole. The child who is not developmentally normal may gag on the food. The challenge is inappropriate for both of these children. Modern day parents also like to present their children with what they consider to be high quality meats. In poultry, for example, this would be the white chicken breast, but this is harder to chew. Dark meat is softer and has a higher fat content, which the child needs. The parents need to be encouraged to present their children with food that they can actually pretty much chew with their fingers. The other two factors include the child and the feeders. Does the child have an evident appetite or a difficult temperament, underlying sensory difficulties or oral motor dysfunction? Do they have an acute or chronic underlying medical illness? Are the feeders creating an appropriate feeding environment? Is there too much control or too much pressure on the child? Are they sensitive to the child's hunger and satiety cues? Parents usually start to feed their children by presenting them with a spoon of food that they present to the child. And when the child opens their mouth, the parent puts the spoon in the child's mouth and then wipes it off on their upper lip. The actual way to present the food to the child is to present them with a spoon placed about an inch in front of the bottom lip and then wait. The child will open their mouth and come and take the food off the spoon when they're ready. This allows the child to be an active feeder paying attention to their appetite rather than a passive feeder relying on their parents' guess. Are the parents overly anxious about the feeding and do they convey this anxiety to the child? This slide depicts the inverse relationship between prevalence of feeding difficulties and their severity. The milder feeding difficulties are far more prevalent and far more likely to present to the primary care physician or dietitian's office. The more severe, the more rare the feeding difficulty. And the more severe, the more likely they need a specialized feeding team to treat them. This slide depicts the prevalence of feeding difficulties. Estimates in the literature are variable because the terminology varies. In a study identifying children by parent self-report as having picky eating, the prevalence is as high as 50 to 60 percent. More specific diagnoses such as selective eating brings the prevalence down to 25 to 35 percent, still a high number. And in prolonged and more difficult feeding difficulties, 1 to 2 percent. However, in the neurologically impaired or developmental disorder population, the prevalence of feeding difficulties approaches 80 percent. In this table, a study by Caruth et al. on parents' self-reported feeding difficulties in their children demonstrates at 19 to 24 months a prevalence of up to 50 percent, while at four to six months the prevalence is 19 percent, still a high rate. The question you have to ask yourself is do feeding difficulties persist, or if we leave them alone will they go away on their own? In this study by Dahl et al., they took a look at children who had an early identification of early refusal to feed in infancy and followed them at nine years of age compared to controls without early refusal to feed. They were identified as having feeding problems by their parents and or their teachers and the children with early refusal to feed had a prevalence of almost 90 percent of persistence of feeding problems compared to controls of less than 40 percent.